Okay, good morning, everybody. It's good to see you all again on this nice sunny day. Hope you enjoyed the snow on Tuesday. That was nice. Um, no snow today, of course. But anywho, all right, I'll uh, I'll get into it. We're going to finish euthanasia today. Hopefully, I'll finish euthanasia and start on abortion and contraception. So I guess, as I said, let's get into it. Get the attendance sheet off to the side here. Okay, let's see, where do we start off? Or right, end off. Okay, conscience formation. Mm. Did I do that? Hold on one second here. Ah, yes, I did. Whoops. Truth. Natural law, positive law, and we talked about that, we talked about that, and we talked about that. Okay. Now, truth, natural law, positive law. Those are the things that all people have for conscience formation, but from the Christian perspective and in the Christian tradition, I told you there are additional sources that a Catholic or a Christian could look at and should look at, and these would be sacred tradition, uh, sacred scripture, excuse me, sacred tradition, and then the magisterium, the teaching authority of the church. So what do, what do those have to say about euthanasia? Well, ah, that's, hello, miss. I should have written that down in my uh, thing, but I did not, Ms. Dela Cruz. Okay. People do kill themselves in the Bible. <laughs> in fact, there's a lot of killing in the Bible, more than you might expect. But, you know, that's more just telling stories of, you know, wars and battles and stuff like that. So people kill and people die. Um, but people do kill themselves in the Bible. They commit suicide. Um, but the Bible really doesn't have any anything to say about that. It doesn't seem to show it in a positive light or a negative light. I guess if I had to weigh it, I'd say mostly the killing, killing yourself is portrayed in a negative light as something that's not, it's, a, it's not something that's a good or a benefit to the person, but it's more implied in the scriptures than it's, it's prohibited. There's no explicit prohibition against suicide or helping someone to commit suicide in the Bible. But there are some indications about um, certain things, which um, I give you one right here from sacred scripture, from the second book of Samuel, um, which is about largely about this man, this prophet Samuel, hence it's called the book of Samuel, but it also has to do with King David and, and their rise at the, um, the, um, the uh, creation of a kingdom in, in Israel. But anyways, uh, Samuel's mother, Hannah, prays to God for a child. She, she thinks she's barren, that she's infertile, and she really wants a child. And so she's sad about that. And um, so she goes to the temple of God, and she prays to God for a child. But that's, that's the long and the short of the prayer. The point I'm interested in is this part of her prayer, which is verse 6. I give you verse 1. And Hannah prayed to God, the Lord puts to death and gives life. He casts down to Sheol, and he brings up again. Now, the point, of, the point of what she's praying for in the immediate context is the Lord gives life, and she wants God to give her a life. She wants God to make her pregnant. And she does become pregnant with Samuel, who is the first prophet of the Jews. He's considered the first one to be, a, properly speaking, a prophet of the Israelites. But the, there's a larger point here, which she, which she makes, which maybe she did not intend, but other people can see in her statement, that the Lord has control over both life and death, over when a person comes into existence and when a person goes out of existence. Well, not fully out of existence, because we believe the soul continues after death. Um, he casts down to Sheol and he brings up again, basically saying the same thing. God sends down to the underworld Sheol, was the Israelites' conception of an underworld, okay? The, the Jews, the, the ancient Jews did not, like a lot of cultures surrounding them, did not have a robust understanding of an afterlife. There was a sort of kind of, either there was no afterlife, you just ceased out of existence, and your life was your life that God gave you while you were alive. Um, but there was also this idea of kind of this place of, 
it wasn't actually a great place to go, but it was something, some place to go, uh, of an afterlife that was kind of a place of darkness um, where, you know, people, the souls that were there or the beings that were there, the people who had been alive at one time were not really happy, but they weren't suffering. It wasn't hell. They weren't really being punished, but they weren't, they were kind of in a state of existence that was kind of static and uninteresting, one might say. Later, this idea will develop amongst the Jews of a heaven and a hell. But at this point in time, Hannah doesn't have that idea, okay? she. But she does have this idea that God sends people to the afterlife, but he can also bring people back from the afterlife. So he can bring life out of death, which is an interesting concept if you believe in the resurrection of Jesus. Another scripture which is more explicit and, and it should be more explicit because it's from the book of wisdom which as i told you was a later development in the jewish scriptures you have wisdom literature develop late in in jewish um I ideas and uh the book of wisdom if i remember correctly it was probably written in greek sometime around 50 bc if i remember what scholars believe if i remember what biblical scholars believe about its history and remember wisdom literature was this attempt by the Jews to kind of take their religious beliefs and apply them to the practical world, okay, to show that, hey, we have wisdom too, that our law, which we have from Moses and from God, ultimately, um, and governs our life, is also a source of wisdom. And so we see Jewish wisdom literature um, arising, and there's wisdom literature in every culture. Every culture has this type of literature of trying to teach people how to live the good life. So in the book of Wisdom, chapter 16, it says, For you, talking to God, for you, God, have dominion, have rulership, have control over life and death. You lead down to the gates of Hades and lead back. Human beings, however, may kill another with malice, but they cannot bring back the departed spirit or release the soul that has confined, or should say been confined. Your hand no one can escape. So here we have a more explicit expression of this idea, which Hannah is already kind of saying um, hundreds of years earlier from the time that she lived um, in relation to the Book of Wisdom when it was written, that life and death are in, on the control of God. And notice it's interesting that this book was written in Greek, so it kind of translates the idea of Sheol into the Greek idea of Hades, which maybe you've heard of, which was the, the Greek conception of the underworld, which was kind of similar to the Jewish conception. It was a place of darkness where the souls went and people who had lived previously, and it wasn't really a place of punishment. It wasn't really a hell. The, the Greeks did have a hell called Tartarus, where the ev really evil people went when you were too bad to go to Hades, Tartarus, where they had all sorts of nasty punishments awaiting you there. Actually, this is my old one. I want my new one. Ah, there it is. Nope. Well, back here. Oh, I gave it away. That's right. Okay, yes. All right, so this is the old one that I can throw out. So what the author, the Jewish author, is doing in the Book of Wisdom is translating the idea of Sheol for those who might not understand it, those who might be Jews, who might be reading it in Greek, because it was written in Greek, and might they would understand Hades, but they might not understand Sheol, which is a Hebrew word. So he translates it to Hades. So God sends down to the underworld, he brings back, human beings can do this, they can kill people, but they can't, unlike God, they can't bring back from the dead. Again, this idea of, kind of, we might say resurrection, but of God bringing back from the dead, or release a soul from death. But from God, no one can escape. So this idea of God having control over life and death. And then also finally from the wisdom of Ben Sira, another book of the wisdom literature, um, also known as the book of Sirach, because it was written by this man, Jesus Ben Sira, Jesus the son of Sira. Um, 
Jesus was a common name amongst the Jews even before Jesus. So just don't just go with it. Um, you could also call him Yeshua. But I, I use the book of Sirach. If you remember way back when at the beginning of the course, I quoted from the book of Sirach. Does anyone remember why? Why I used the book of Sirach? In what context? What did I quote for quote it for? We've encountered the wisdom of Ben Sira before, but what was he writing about? Let's see. Mr. Thatch! About how the position is the agent of God. Excellent, Mr. Thatch! Yes! About physicians. Ben Sira also ha has this long, long po poem, I should say, where he praises the physician and tells people, yes, trust in God, but go to the physician. Okay? So here we have Ben Sira. And in chapter 11, there's this little thing where he says, good and evil, life and death, poverty and riches, all are from the Lord. So again, life and death come from God. Now you might say, well, wait a second, doesn't it say also that evil comes from God? Yes, but you have to understand at this stage of development in the Jewish mind, there, there were no intermediate causes for Jews in the way they thought. They, everything directly came from God. So even evil things came from God in their mind. So there needs to be, there is later development on that. In, uh, uh, there's later development that needs to occur. But just so you understand how the Jewish mind worked, God was the cause of everything. So they couldn't think of, well, there could be something intervening that might happen that God might permit, but not intend, you know, some evil. Yes, sir. There we are. There we go. Okay, so what is this all telling us? Well, if you haven't gotten the point by now, I'll, I will explicitate it for you that God alone has control over death. Men, men and women also have control over death because, it, as it says in the Book of Wisdom, men and women can kill. They can take the life of another human being. But ultimately, the control over life and death comes from God. Even in the case of, say, capital punishment, which is approved of in the Bible and which the church is approved of um, through most of her, for most of her teaching, although now the church, the modern church is leaning more towards mercy and um, repentance and not towards killing the, uh, a person who has committed a crime, allowing them to live. Um, nevertheless, in capital punishment, the, the principle is that the person has the authority from God to do it. But ultimately, all authority over life and death comes from the Lord, or derives, or co goes back to the Lord, I should say. That's scripture. What does the magisterium have to say on the matter? Well, we can go to Gaudium et Space, which I have quoted to you, uh, quoted from before, or mentioned before, which is yes. Hello, ladies. Good morning. Good morning. The pastoral constitution on the church in the modern world. Okay. On the church in the modern world, or also known as Gaudium et Space. Hopefully you know what that is by now, so I don't have to explain it to you. Um, this is at a high level of the magisterium, the teaching authority of the church, because it is a document of an, an, a universal council of the Catholic Church, of all the bishops meeting together and teaching. And it is a constitution. It's a pastoral constitution. So it's talking about something that is constitutive of the Catholic faith. And within that document, it condemns, quote, whatever is opposed to life itself. For example, any type, and it gives a list, any type of murder, genocide, abortion, euthanasia, or willful self-destruction, which you could say is suicide. And it also lists other things that are against life, like slavery, um, oppression of the poor, oppression of people, um, stuff like that. Oh, yes. Anything that detracts from or disvalues human life is condemned. And it gives a longer list than I'm giving you. I'm just giving you what is according to our purpose for what we're talking about now. 
the teaching or the magisterium of the church is summarized in, for example, in the catechism of the Catholic Church, and to catechize or a catechism, if I didn't tell you this before, I'll tell you now, is basically instruction in the faith, instruction in beliefs. Okay, and years ago in the 90s, the Catholic Church put out a book called The Catechism of the Catholic Church, which incorporates or encapsulates all the basic beliefs that the Catholic Church holds. And it's, it's a resource if you want to look something up quickly and find out, well, what does the church teach without having to plow through all sorts of documents or find them on the Internet, you can go to the Catechism. Um, they even have a compendium of the Catholic Church. Compendium is like a summary, so even if you don't want to read the whole catechism, you can go to this compendium, which is also online, which gives you a briefer version of the catechism in, in question and answer form. So it's easy. What does this, the catechism of the Catholic Church say? Or summarize for us. In number two, 2,280, paragraph 2,280. Everyone is responsible for his or her life before God who has given it to him. It is God who remains the sovereign master of life. We are obliged to accept life gratefully and preserve it for his honor and the salvation of our souls. We are stewards, not owners, of the life God has entrusted to us. It is not ours to dispose of. Okay, so let's go over this. Life is something that ultimately comes, though the belief is comes from God. He is the source of life. We are not, we are contingent beings. We are not the source of our own lives, obviously. We have parents. We all have parents. That's something that I think is a universal and we can universally agree on. So, just objectively, we, uh, we re recognize that we are not the source of our own lives. We weren't sitting there in our mother's womb and decide at one point, hey, I'm going to become an embryo. <laughs> you know, poof, here I am, you know. <laughs> Blastasis present, woo -woo, you know. No, <laughs> you know, you, it comes from something. There are whole sorts of processes. That, there's a whole process by which you come into being. You know, you are in being and then you develop in being, in your existence. Um, so where does this ultimately come? Um, well, if you're a religious person, you say God. Of course, if you're not religious, you might have you would have a different answer to that. Um, something, something causes the process to occur. I don't know what what necessarily someone who did not believe in God would say. Um, you might say evolution, but that's that's you know that's not. Uh, that's not necessarily the whole answer of it. Um, but anyways, for, from a Catholic perspective, God is the source of life, is the source of it, which is another way of saying the source of existence. God is that which exists in and of himself. Okay, there is nothing beyond God in existence. He is, his existence is the same as his nature. His nature is to exist. So in a manner of speaking, it's kind of, it's illogical or it doesn't make any sense to say God doesn't exist because by nature, his nature is to exist. It is existence itself. So God has control over what happens with life and death. It is something that has been given. Even if you don't believe in God, you believe life has been given to you by your parents, however that process might work. Okay, whatever your answer might be to that question of how the process happens. And we accept that life, and part of the natural law is the preservation of life. That's the first, thing, first of our inclinations according to the natural law. We view our life as a benefit, as a good. So we try to continue our lives as best we can. Because we really live on the precipice. It doesn't take very much to end a life. Stop drinking water for a week. Just water. Okay, or try not sleeping for a week. Even not sleeping can start start the body to break down, men, both mentally and physically, and can cause death. So things, sim things that we simply, I say simple things are not so simple, but they're simple in this fact that we don't think about them. We don't think about, we just eat. We know we need to eat and we need to drink. We know we need to sleep. These things, very if we ignore them or, or don't perform them within a very short period of time, can kill us. So we kind of do live on the edge of a knife when it comes to life. It doesn't take a lot to push us over the edge towards death. A simple sickness. Think of COVID. 
which was, you know, a virus and bacteria, they can push us over the edge and kill us. So it doesn't take a lot. So we, we are called to preserve our lives. And we try to do this. We try to do things that preserve our lives. That's our inclination. So if life is given to us, if we accept that principle that we are not the creators of our own life, we didn't simply pop into existence in the fallopian tube of our mothers one day, um, then we are not the owners of that life. We have been given a gift in a sense, a present that we are to take care of and to maintain. We are stewards, as it says. Now, the question then becomes, but if I've been given this gift, can I do with it what I want to do with it? And that's a, that's a question that's involved in euthanasia. Um, do I have not have, once I've been given this life, do I also have a right attached to it that out of justice you have to respect? That's a question. It's not immediately obvious from, it's not immediately obvious maybe from truth or the natural law because you now have this life, you have control over the life, but does it mean absolute control? Maybe not because we don't, we don't accept forms of suicide. Suicide is seen as a defect, as something that's not a benefit to the human person. So maybe we naturally already see that to to, a person can take his or her own life, but we don't want them to do it. We might accept the person doing it, but the general reaction naturally is not one of rejoicing, like, hey, Bob killed himself the other day, guy, hey, good for him. You know? like, no, it's usually like, you might say, well, I understand why Bob did it. You know, I feel for Bob. Maybe Bob's not in any more suffering because of it. But it's like, you still might wish, I wish Bob hadn't done it. I still wish Bob were around, you know, if, if he's my friend or someone I love or care about. It's usually not a cause for celebration. So it is a question, though, that you have to ask. To, to what extent do I have this absolute right, that I, do I have an absolute right over life which I've been given? Okay, or is there something that's still under control? Euthanasia is a form of suicide, physician assistant suicide or suicide suicide. And according to the catechism, suicide contradicts the natural inclination of the human being to preserve or perpetuate his life or her life. And because of that, it is gravely, seriously contrary to the just love of self. Okay, so here we come to the point of justice, to give something or someone its due. Out of justice, I owe certain things to others, other persons, that virtue of justice. I owe things to God, which is what we call religion. It's a form of justice. But I also owe things to myself. I owe it to myself to keep myself in existence, which takes work, takes effort. So suicide or asking someone to commit suicide on my behalf is a violation of this virtue. It's breaking this virtue of justice that I owe to myself, if we look at it from the perspective of virtue ethics. It likewise offends love of neighbor because it unjustly breaks the ties of solidarity with family nation, and other human societies to which we continue to have obligations. Yes, a person who commits suicide doesn't do it, No, as the, the saying goes, it, it, it's, uh, well, this, maybe you've heard the saying, no man is an island. We are interconnected. And maybe there's the exception that proves the rule of someone who commits suicide and nobody cares. It doesn't affect anybody. <laughs> so, but Hopefully not. In the case of many, I would say a lot of suicides, there are human interconnections that are then ruptured by the suicide. There might be, say, if the person is a, someone's father, that person has an obligation to the child, has an obligation to the spouse that are now ru ruptured and broken by killing himself or herself. And this is not, this, again, this is, repeat what I said at the very beginning of all of this. This is not in any way a judgment on a person. You know, I place these people, a person who commits suicide, in the mercy of God. I'm not standing in judgment of anybody. But I'm just saying what seems to be the reality. The reality is, is that there are, there are bonds that are broken by the suicide that might were there before, and even obligations, if a person has a 
you know, like a parent that needs needs him or her to take care of them, um, or if you have a spouse or a child, these are broken. You have friendships that are broken, people who are your friend who now don't have the pleasure of having your friendship anymore. So there are obligations that are, there are ties and obligations that are broken. And even human society doesn't benefit from you. Human society loses something when you go. Because you are, as a human being, you are a value. You provide value to human society. And su suicide is contrary to the love that we owe to the living God. God is given a present. He's given a gift, the gift of life. And to say, I don't want, I'm choosing not to have this life anymore. I don't, this life is even bad to me. Living is bad for me is an offense in that sense against God. It's, it's kind of, uh, it could be seen as a form of ingratitude, of not living in thankfulness for the life that you still do have. You're in the game. You were meant to be here. Suicide and also euthanasia, generally speaking, comes under the, the fifth commandment, which is you shall not kill, which is a form of murder. And so that's how the catechism, well, catechism C talks about the fifth commandment in 2268 to 2269. The fifth, what does the fifth commandment forbid? It forbids the direct and intentional killing of someone as gravely sinful. This is not a good thing. The murderer and those who cooperate voluntarily in murder commit a sin that cries out to heaven for vengeance. That's how serious it is. It's, it's one of those sins that there are certain sins that cry out to God for punishment because it's usurping God's something that's essential to God's control over, over um, reality, which is the creation of life. So the fifth commandment forbids doing anything with the intention, even the intention of indirectly bringing out a person's death. So to directly and intentionally kill someone is certainly bad, but even to indirectly want someone to die is a breaking of the fifth commandment. This is a long quote, I know, but it, it's it's to my purpose. It says what I want it, want to say. Um, this is from the reading. Maybe you read this. Hopefully, you read this from the Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith. I didn't put down the year that they put this out. I think it was in the 1990s. Should have written down the year. Oh well. Well, maybe I have it down here. Nope, I don't. Anyways, um, from, the, from the Vatican, the Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which issues documents related to doctrinal issues and answers questions, one of the questions that came up was on euthanasia, the, the purpose uh, bishops ask, you know, what are we to think of this practice? And so the uh, congregation issued a declaration called Jura et Bona. I think I've mentioned it before. Where it goes over this goes over this uh, this issue and says it is necessary to state firmly once more, meaning that it's been stated before by the church. So this is not this might be a new issue in the sense that you know uh, it was being legalized in some places in the world, but it was not a new issue in the sense that the church had ever confronted this issue before of, of you might call mercy killing or uh, assisted suicide. It is necessary to state firmly once more that nothing and no one can in any way permit killing of an innocent human being. That's the essential principle, to kill or take the life or remove the existence of someone who doesn't deserve to have it taken away. Whether a fetus or an embryo, an infant or an adult, an old person, or one suffering from an incurable disease, or a person who is dying. Right? Furthermore, no one is permitted to ask for this act of killing, either for himself or herself, or for another person entrusted to his or her care, nor can he or she consent to it, either explicitly or implicitly, nor can any authority legitimately recommend or permit such an action. So talk, this is probably geared towards governments that want to institute laws in regards to it. Why? For it is a question of the violation of the divine law an offense against the dignity of the human person, a crime against life, and an attack on humanity. Okay, so here they enumerate several principles. Divine law 
I guess we could also say the natural law, because the natural law is a participation in the divine law. But the divine law is how God, remember, how God expects the universe to, to perform, to be. And one of those things is life. You see the emergence of life in his universe. That's something that God apparently intends to be present in the universe. Um, you also see death and destruction, but you, know, you also see things coming into existence and living things. Um, we talked about the, the value and dignity of the human person already, that um, there, are cer there are values, certain values as persons that make us, things that make us better and perfect us and benefit us, and that these are supposed to be encouraged and not discouraged. And euthanasia or killing does this. It discourages this primary basic value of, of living, of being alive. And that's why you can't really, a certain person is not intended, uh, is not permitted to intentionally do this to a person, which we kind of recognize in society. But it's also not appropriate for someone to ask for it to be done to put another person in that situation of asking them to do something which is in and of itself uh, a disvalue to their life. Yes, sir, go ahead. How do they define innocent human being? Oh, innocent, that's a good question. Um, and I, oh, actually I will, I'll talk about that with abortion, but I'll talk about it now. Basically, innocent, and I think this is based on the actual etymology of the word innocent in Latin, means not to kill. So someone who is innocent is someone who does not deserve to be killed or punished, basically. Not, or you could extend it and broaden it and say uh, someone who does not have something bad or evil done to them, have a, a, a benefit taken away from them, any benefit that they might have. Um, life, property, their good name, stuff like that. So they're, they're innocent. Um, that doesn't necessarily mean they're good, because <laughs> you understand the difference in court where they say, well, we said the person, well, they'll say this is, um, maybe it's not, eh, that's not a good example because it's kind of the reverse, people use it in the reverse. Um, but that doesn't mean the person is necessarily a good person or doing good things, but it means that in justice, they don't deserve at that point, they haven't done something that deserves punishment or, or, or certainly you don't have the authority to mete out the punishment to that person, okay? Um, a person has to be, and we see that we, this is established in our law system, that the person has to be proven, it has to be proven that the person deserves punishment, okay? Even though a person, you may know a person has done a bad thing, but you still bring them to a court of law and someone has to prove this person is not innocent, this person deserves punishment. Understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Okay. So that's what we mean. That's what we mean by innocent. Simply to exist is not to deserve punishment. <laughs> is not to deserve harm. Simply because a being exists does not mean the person deserves harm out of justice. So that's what we're talking about here: the killing of an innocent human being. The should say the intentional killing of an, uh, an innocent human being. The direct killing of a human being of an innocent human being. Um, now, you might ask, well, what about wartime and stuff like that? Those are different situations where you're not talking about innocent human beings because you're at wartime and the person who, an aggressor, should be an aggressor, has attacked you or is trying to attack you. So they're not undeserving of punishment. You're trying, and you have the right to defend your own life as well. That does not necessarily mean you have to use lethal means Although in modern warfare, it almost always does, which is a problem with modern warfare. But that doesn't seem like it's about to change. And no one seems to listen to the teachings of the church on modern warfare, um, even Catholics. But nevertheless, so I just want to mention that because someone might have that question in their mind. So I'm not, I'm, that's all I'm going to say about that. I don't want to go out down a rabbit hole on that. Nevertheless, so, according, so these are the principles. This is how the magisterium informs us. Because as I said, it's not necessarily clear from just talking about truth and the natural law um, what follows from that. You might agree with, well, yes, life is a benefit, life is a value. Um, it's true that, you know, we're meant to be alive and we're meant to take care of our lives and it's natural to us as part of our human nature to want to be alive. However, Dr. Dunn, there might be situations where a person is in such suffering that they sh 
because they've been given life, they have control over that life. And just as I have control over my life, like what I'm going to do with my life, how my life is going to develop, at the end of my life, I could also decide when the end of my life should be. And that's also my right. So it's not necessarily apparent that you don't have that right. So here we have God, in a way, through revelation and the teaching authority of Christ's church, giving clarity on that, that no, you don't, you don't have, you have, you have the right to develop your life in the way that you've been given it. You've been given freedom and choice in your life, but some choices are beyond, outside the boundary. God has defined in a way, he's kind of drawn the box of how he wants life to be. Within that box, you have all sorts of freedom to develop it, but there are certain boundaries out which you should not go. You can still go. Notice you can still go. A person can still cross that boundary and kill himself or herself. God doesn't step in at the last moment and say, give me that knife. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Give me that gun or magically make the bullet not, you know, poof, go, become invisible when a person tries to shoot himself. Um, so, but, the, but God sets the boundary and tells you what the boundary is. This is my point. Okay, so here we have, we return to the uh, United States Catholic uh, Conference of Catholic Bishops Statement on Ethical and Religious Directives for Catholic Health Care Services. And it should not surprise us that um, euthanasia is mentioned because it, it can come up, obviously, with people who are suffering in, in a health care situation. And so you have Directive number 60. First, it defines what euthanasia is. A good de I think it's a good definition, and I think I based my definition off of it. Euthanasia is an action or it's something you do or something you don't do, an action or an omission that is of itself or by intention causes, de causes death in order to alleviate suffering. Um, yeah, all right, nothing I want to say about that. Catholic healthcare institutions may never condone or participate in euthanasia or assisted suicide in any way. What, what should happen then? What, okay, so that's the negative. What's the positive action? Dying patients who request euthanasia should receive loving care. Okay, so love of God, love of neighbor, response of love and compassion, psychological and spiritual support, and appropriate remedies for pain and other symptoms so that they can live with dignity until the time of natural death. So you give them love, you give them support, and you give them drugs or medications that can alleviate the pain, take away the pain as much as possible, um, while allowing them to die naturally, because they probably are dying. And that is natural, and that's fine. Killing is not natural. Bringing about death unnaturally is not natural. Uh, I don't know if I want to go. Yeah, I guess I will. Okay. When you talk about euthanasia, you have to talk about this guy in the United States. Um, I guess I should talk about him, but uh, maybe I could move on. Nah, I will talk about him. Dr. Jack Kevorky, and I don't know if anyone's heard of this guy or heard of his, heard his name anywhere. Anyone heard, hear of him? No? Okay. You can see a picture of him there on Time Magazine, so he was at some sometime in history famous in America. His name was Murad Jacob, a.k.a. Jack Kevorkian. Um, he lived from 1928. He died in 2011. He was an Armenian-American. Interestingly enough, he was for parents for, from Armenia. And he publicly campaigned, he was known for his public campaign for a terminal patient's right to die by a physician-assisted suicide, which he participated in. He, claim, he himself claimed to have performed over 130 procedures of um, helping people kill themselves, and in one case that we know of directly killing the person, um, which got him sent to jail, but I'll mention that in a moment. Uh, did I put that there? All right, well, there's some, some facts about him. Uh, he was born in Pontiac, Michigan, which is where he seemed to operate most of his life. 1952, he graduated from the University of Michigan Medical School, and he completed a residency in anatomical and clinical pathology. A pathologist, well, as you might know, in general, a pathologist is usually people who cuts up dead bodies and figures out why the person died. 
Okay, so they figure out what disease killed the person or what what the what uh, injury or whatever killed the person. But a pathologist, pathologist technically is a specialist in studying the essential nature of disease and how it affects the structure and function of the body. So I guess when you're a pathologist, you go to medical school and then you go into your specialty of pathology where you're not looking at healing the body, but you're looking for all those things that can cause damage to the body so that you can recognize them when you're performing autopsies and whatnot. In 1987, he started advertising in newspapers, um, promoting something that, uh, uh, his offering himself as a physician who would consult people on death counseling, is how he described it. Um, and it took a few years until it took till 1990 before he got his first um, client, who was a woman with Alzheimer's disease, who asked him to assist her in her suicide. That's what he meant by death counseling. He didn't mean counseling you about death. He meant counseling you about how you wanted to die. If you had, now, it should say he argued for terminal patients, but Alzheimer's is not really, I mean, it's a disease, and it will eventually lead to death, but it's, it's not something like cancer, something that we might assume was more terminal than that. But anyways, um, that, that was the first person he... he uh, he helped with a physician-assisted suicide. No charges were brought against Kaborkian at that time because there was no law against it in Michigan. Okay, there was, there's, you know, it wasn't, it wasn't on their radar screen that that uh, this might happen. Though his medical license was revoked, eventually they did put laws on the books and they tried Kaborkian four times for the crime of euthanasia, but he was acquitted on three of those and a mistrial on the fourth. But there was a change in 1999 with his um, participation in a euthanasia of a voluntary euthanasia. It was a voluntary euthanasia. If you remember what voluntary euthanasia is, where the, the patient is killed with the patient's informed consent. There was a voluntary euthanasia of Thomas Yauch, who is in the final stages of Lou, what's called Lou Gehrig's disease, but it's also called AL, ALS. And I give you the, the long form name, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, which I'm not a physician, so I have no idea what that means. I mean, I, I, I know what the words kind of mean, but I don't know, you know, why they call it that. But anyways, but basically what it is, it's a degenerative nerve disease. It destroys your nerves of the spine, spinal column in the brain. And so it will affect your speech, it'll affect motor function and stuff like that. And eventually your body will shut down from it in the final stages and you'll die. <laughs> So it causes a lot of weakness and stuff like that. On this one, this was different. Thomas Yauch's death was different because, I mean, he may have done this before. We don't know, or I don't know. Um, but at least in this procedure, he directly killed the patient. He had made this machine where, you know, he would, uh, you know, there were three bottles. And, you know, one bottle, I think, had like saline solution in it. And I forget what the other bottle had. But then the final bottle had a poison in it that a pers the person would inject himself or herself. He would put the needle in for them to do it, a p needle in the vein. And then the person would uh, himself press a button or herself press a button that would release the poison. So he was not, he was just providing the means. He was not actively... Um, actively doing the euthanasia. He was assisting in it, but he was not, even in his assistance, he was not himself pushing the button. Now, that raises an interesting question, because that's not necessarily um, directly performing euthanasia, but that is, I could say, cooperation. What form of cooperation do you think that might be? Performing illicit action, just pressing, you know, or providing an instrument, Illicit action, which is in and of itself may not be immoral, but leads to an immoral act, leads to an evil action. Cooperation. What kind of cooperation do you think that might be? Well, what are the kinds of cooperation? There are two essential kinds. It'll show up on the test, his research. <laughs> what are the two forms of cooperation in an act, another person's action? And this could even be for good actions. Not maybe I'm, talking, so I'm focusing on evil actions, but this could be a good action. 
cooperation. What do we got? Two. One and two. Uno and dos. Mm -hmm. I'm from Spy. Miss Tolman. Is it a formal and material? Formal and material. Formal and material. Formal and material. Formal cooperation is what? What do you want to tell me what formal cooperation is? In a person's action? Mr. Diesel? Formal cooperation. <laughs> I'm still here. And we're deciding like how he, we're deciding if he can formal or material. Well, first let's find out what formal is. Okay. Then we can decide. Let's find out what formal and material are. What is formal cooperation? You can look in your notes. It's not you know I'm not trying to surprise you with it. I mean, uh, well, formals. Um, you formally cooperate, willing to equal action or sharing in it. Excellent, sir. You you cooperate by sharing in the action. Okay. Someone wants to go kill somebody. I say, okay, good. Here's a gun. Go kill him. That's formal cooperation. I haven't done the killing. The other person has done the killing, but I have formally shared it. I've kind of signed the form. I'm like, yes, you sign off on this? Yes. Material cooperation I'll give you because I might use a gun on myself if I wait for the end. <laughs> no, sorry about that. Trigger alert. Um, no pun intended. Um, Material cooperation is where you don't formally, you don't share in the action, but you perform some action which kind of moves, you know, is is associated with the action. Okay, so for example, I um, I gave you the example of say you're a nurse at a hospital and part of your job is you're, you're anti-abortion, you don't know, approve of abortion, but Part of your job is they perform abortions at the hospital and you have to clean the instrument. So you have to might do that. Or you might a better example might be you give post post operative care to a woman who's had an abortion, even though you don't agree with it, it's against your conscience. Um, you are not formally, because you're not involved in the abortion at all, but you are materially cooperating. Now the cooperation could be proximate or could be remote. It could be immediate, where you're directly materially cooperating in what's going on, um, which would probably be washing the uh, instruments of an abortion. Or it could be remote, where, you know, you're just taking care of the, the woman who was involved in the abortion. You're not dealing with the instruments, you're not dealing with the action, but you're taking, it's your job to take care and give care um, to the person who had the procedure. That would probably be remote. It's, re it's not remote in the sense of time or space, it's remote in the sense of connection to the action that was done, of performing the action. You didn't perform the action directly or even indirectly. Okay. Um, in this case, I guess let's let's unpack this because Doctor Death, as he was called, see that in Time Magazine, um, and he didn't seem to have a problem with that. But it, it was it, he was apparently called Doctor Death even before he got involved in euthanasia because he liked to study death. He would uh, this was mentioned in the book Blessings. Um, Blessing of Life, our, our textbook for the course. It mentions Kevorkian, and Kevorkian used to take pictures of people, of their eyes, as they died when he was, I guess, I don't know, in hospitals because it fascinated him. He wanted to see if you could actually see the point of death in their eyes, um, which kind of made, gave him the nickname Dr. Death for his fascination with it. But anyways, um, in this case, I would say it was formal cooper excuse yeah, formal cooperation because he, in the t case of Yao, because he himself directly gave the, the, um, the lethal injection to Yao into his heart that caused his heart to stop. So that would be formal cooperation. But in the other cases where he was just providing the machine and he wasn't even pressing the button that released the lethal medication, um, I would say it was cooperation, but it was material cooperation, but I'd say it's proximate because he's directly providing them with the machine to cause their death. Now, whether that's a good or a bad thing, that's you, you have to ask. It depends on whether you agree with it. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was going to say kind of like, yeah, I don't know, like good or bad thing. I was like, 
Okay, like better things to do, like the people, like they will have better like medical cases to like to like bring up. Like if the patients agree to, if uh, they're in so much pain that they want, they agree that they want to like pass away. Like, I don't really see the problem with the person. Yeah, uh, you don't see the problem. Yeah, I feel like. I don't Why don't you see a problem? Hmm? Why don't you see like, a problem? Because um, I feel like pain and suffering. If they don't feel like pain and suffering is worth it. Is worth like living like that sort of thing like that they're experiencing then why should they have to live pain and suffer it's not really living at that point like, yeah you're experiencing that much pain and suffering you don't feel like you're living your life so what should they do about it i don't think there should be a problem with it personally like, a problem with what with, with a person with decision yeah i don't feel like he's doing anything wrong if they're giving more like consent and they're and they have like the and they're in the right mental state to like give informed consent then i don't think it's a problem Okay. Like, but if they need a guardian or like uh, someone to take like legal action for them, like sign the papers, and things, too. But they don't have that in the right line. But uh, I just don't see why they're making a big deal over it. Well, making a big deal. Well, okay. Can anyone see why there might be a big deal over? Well, is suicide a big deal? It is, but like, I feel like okay, it's different in certain situations. Okay, so but but it is suicide, yes, because yeah. because they call it physician assistant suicide. Yeah, so you admit that suicide is a big deal. Yeah. So it is a big deal by extension. I guess so, but it's like a different situation. <laughs> okay, it's a di okay. I grant you that it is a different situation, but it is a big deal. Yeah. Okay, so so it's not so we 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 agree with that. It is a big deal. It is something that needs to be ethically considered. Yeah. Okay. Um, is suicide it's is suicide itself something that should be done or should not be done or should could be done in certain circumstances a person could decide he he or she wants to kill himself or herself yeah i feel like but i feel like a lot of it is with going back to like the mental state whether that's like the like what i was saying earlier like in this case like they're experiencing physical pain but like other cases it's like they're not mentally like stable or like in like the right mindset okay to make that decision can mental pain be also an excuse for it? I don't know. That's what I was. That's what I was thinking. Like they need to like look into it. Okay. Well, well, they have <laughs> I mean, because these issues have come up. You know. So, for example, in the Netherlands, which I mentioned before, um, euthanasia started out as as what you said that it would be for physical pain for a terminal illness. Someone is dying and they're in such excruciating pain that they don't want to continue through the dying process. But now the, the definition has been extended to include people who are in such severe mental pain, psychological pain, that they just don't want to live anymore. So what about that? What do you think? I feel like it's the same like equal thing. I feel like it doesn't matter like, what type of pain it is. I just okay. It's like we looked in like determined that it like it's like the right amount for them to i don't want to sound like a certain way but like deserve like a physician assistant suicide like you know what i mean like yeah no i understand i feel like there needs to be like tests on like things like that okay yeah and, and even in the case of those who uh, where the euthanasia is legal like in the state of oregon or someplace like that there are certainly conditions on you know you can't just you can't just kill a patient because a patient wants to die that's not sufficient enough because as you as you said you know you have to assign assume or you have to assess their mental state is the person then just going through a deep depression which they might come out of or is the person in pain but the pain will recede will result will recede it won't be forever okay the pain will be over with um eventually uh so you just you don't want to kind of um jump the gun in a manner of speaking and do that okay no but i see your point but i would say that suicide seems to be always a disvalue even if a person wants it yeah. because why do we intervene why do we try to intervene in it i mean if you knew somebody who was going to commit suicide would your immediate reaction be to help the person and intervene or would your reaction be the opposite which is okay let me go find you something to commit suicide with because the person wants to commit suicide for a reason. It's not because like, oh, I'm having a happy day. Get me that razor. <laughs> you know, it's usually because the person is in intense, maybe chronic pain or, or mental, me mental suffering. They're not in a good place. So what makes it different if, different if a person is suffering in a hospital because of a disease? 
why is suicide then something we should not intervene on and say, okay, why do you want to do this? Maybe you shouldn't do this. Or it's something to say, okay, let's talk about that. Let's, let's make, a, make a plan here. You're just going to watch that, right? Yeah. Well, I guess it's like, like I was saying earlier, like, I mean, I think it depends on, like, a person's, like, mental state. Like, a lot of cases, like, outside, because, like, depression, like, drug use or, like, anything else like that, but, like, you see, like, a lot of cases of suicide with. I mean, it's because they're not in the right mental state. Not in the right... Do you think of... Sorry, go ahead. And I feel like I feel like that needs to be determined by... I feel like in every... Even in these situations, I feel like the first, the first course of action should be to, like, be concerned and think, like, well, that's not good that you want to commit suicide. But I feel like if you, like, go over, like, an experience, if you give them, like, mental and, like, physical tests to, like, rate their, like, pain and figure out, like, what's actually going on with them, then I feel like you need to look at, like, other courses of action, which could mean, like, physician-assisted suicide. Could mean. So, yeah. would you accept that you should try to manage the pain first? Yes, definitely. Okay. I don't think it should be, like, the first course, like, just send them off and, like, inject them or something. Like, I don't think that should be, like, the first course of action. Sure. But I feel like, in certain cases, I feel like there's nothing wrong with it. Like, like if this is the course of action, that like, the, like if they're like in an extreme amount of pain, like a lot of people are just like laying in bed and just like in like an extreme amount of pain where they don't, or they can't move, they can't talk, like nothing like that. Like they just don't feel like they're living and like they're just hooked up to machines. Like I don't feel like that's really living at that point. Sure, it's so, the quality of life. So I feel like it's just a determinant. Like it's every situation is like different. I feel like it needs to be treated that way. Okay, it should just be like a, a rule like across the board. Interesting. Very good. Appreciate it. Thank you for that, sir. Anybody else? <laughs> All right. Moving along. Um, well, not moving along, but moving on to, you know, as I've told you, I've told you enough about, uh, well, I didn't tell you that. Um, yeah. The, for, okay. So cooperation, uh, we talked about that. Um, he was charged with murder for this, and in fact, and he wanted to be charged with murder because he wanted the he wanted the um, his actions to go to the courts because he thought the courts would vindicate him ultimately, and that euthanasia would be declared a right. Um, and so uh, he was charged finally with murder, and on this one he was convicted and he was sentenced to ten to twenty five years in jail, um, but he, which he served some of it, but he was paroled in two thousand and seven after serving eight years. And as we know, he died a few years later in 2011, not by euthanasia, by the way. <laughs> okay. So just in case you're wondering, no, he did not have any terminal illness or suffering that, want, that he wanted to end. You know, he wanted, it, was, it, it was a right he wanted for himself, but he was exercising it for others, too. Um, maybe, but maybe I'll, I'll move on so I can get to, uh, well, maybe not. I'll show it to you. Sorry, I think out loud. This is an interview with uh, Dr. Kaborki, and let me just make sure with the. Uh, the volume is up sufficiently. Okay, so let's hear him make his case. Mm. No sound. One second here. Let me just make sure I don't have it on mute. Whoops. Whoops. There we go. So that's up. Let's make sure the computer's not on mute here. There we go. There. Okay. There we go. All right, so let's see if this will work now. There we go. 60 minutes rewind. Dr. Jack Kevorkian, who has acknowledged helping more than 130 patients kill themselves, tonight reveals that two months ago he killed one of his patients himself and recorded it on videotape. And he acknowledges that this killing could get him sentenced to prison for the rest of his life. Dr. Kevorkian has been tried and acquitted three times on the charge of assisting suicides, but this is different. He himself does the killing. The videotape you will shortly see will disturb some of you, but Dr. Kevorkian, who brought us this tape, says he wants to use this case to move the public debate from doctor-assisted suicide to euthanasia. 
death triggered directly by a doctor. Dr. Kavorkin says that's what he did to Tom Yelp, a victim of Lou Gehrig's disease. Yeah. In a few minutes, you will actually see Dr. Kavorkin end this man's life. First, though, we'll tell you why Mr. Young wanted Dr. Kavorkin to do it, and why the doctor wanted you to see him do it, even though it could get him charged with murder. You killed him. I did, but it's could be manslaughter, not murder. It's not necessarily murder. But it doesn't bother me what you call it. I know what it is. This could never be a crime in any society which deems itself enlightened. Tom Young led an active life. He restored and raced vintage cars. But two years ago, at age 50, he was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease, a devastating, incurable illness that destroyed his muscles. He lost the use of his legs and then his arms. His family says he was in terrible pain, had trouble breathing and swallowing, and was choking on his own saliva. So they wrote Dr. Kevorkian, who lives nearby, and he videotaped his first meeting with Tom. Can you move your legs at all? Um, how about your left arm? <laughs> Try. That's all you can do? You can't lift your hand off the finger? Trying to talk to Tom, you learn how bad he was. He couldn't also make intelligible words. Yeah, barely. Barely intelligible. Barely. From the tape, you can see. Uh, barely. Right. What is your religion? Bad thing. Bad thing. Do you have any children? Okay. And you could see him breathing, gasping, leaning back every time he tried to talk. He couldn't he couldn't sputter more than a few syllables at a time because of the weak muscles. And he was terrified of choking. Terrified. Up to now, Kovokian says he's helped people to die by having the patient flip the switch to start the lethal drugs flowing. And Tom could have done that. But Kovokian suggested that instead. He gave Tom a lethal injection. He says that's more reliable and more humane. And he wants to push the public debate from doctor-assisted suicide to euthanasia. Did Tom know that you were making, in effect, an example yes. of him? Yes. He did? Yes. And, and I sensed some reluctance in him. I, I did. Because he thought he was getting assisted suicide. That's right. And, and actually, this is better than assisted suicide. I explained that to him. It's better control. Uh, and uh, uh, then he, he did agree, which uh, I think, I didn't force him to agree, he did agree. Maybe you know he agreed. I had him sign uh, saying that he chose direct injection, and he, he, and he, signed, this, and he signed it. Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to read it to you, Tom, and I want you to understand, I want to make sure you understand it, and you gotta, you got to listen closely, and stop me if you can't understand it. Mm -hmm. This reads this way. I, Thomas Yelk, the undersigned, entirely voluntarily without any reservation external persuasion pressure or duress and after prolonged and thorough deliberation hereby consent to the following medical procedure of my own choosing and that you have chosen direct injection uh, or what they call active euthanasia to be administered by a competent medical professional in order to end with certainty my intolerable and hopelessly incurable suffering. Did you understand all that? Okay. Tom signed the statement and thought he was about to die, but Dr. Kevorkian wanted to postpone it to give Tom more time to think it over. You sure you thought about this very well? Huh? You don't want to wait another month or so? You want to wait a week? How about two weeks? Two weeks? One week? Can you wait one week? Yeah. All right, at least we'll stretch it out one week. Okay. Let's not hurry into this. But I got a call the next night from his brother saying, Tom wants it now. And I couldn't say, well, no, I'm going to make you wait a week while well, what was happening. He just was terrified and getting, he wasn't, he was so very afraid of choking to death. And he must have felt that he was on the verge of it. And I couldn't have him suffer in that kind of frame of mind because if the man is terrified, it's up to me to dispel that terror. So two nights after the first visit, Dr. Kevorkian returned. 
The family had been told to leave before he arrived to avoid possible criminal charges as accessories. Tom, do you want to go ahead with this? Yeah. Shake your head yes if you want to go. All right, uh, I'm going to have you sign again your name and I'm, we're going to date it today, okay? And we're ready to inject. We're going to inject in your right arm. Okay? Okay. First, the doctor gave him second off to put him to sleep quickly. Sleepy, John? Tell him, are you asleep? Tell him, are you asleep? You asleep? He's asleep. Then he injected a muscle relaxant to stop his breathing. And this paralyzes the muscles. And he's still alive. He's still alive, but... Uh, and that's why I can see him breathing just a try. That's why I have to, yes, now you see, now that the lack of oxygen is getting to him now. But he's unconscious deeply, so it doesn't matter. Is he dead now? Um, or he's dying now. Because his oxygen's cut off, he can't breathe. So I'll now quickly inject the potassium chloride to stop the heart. Now there's a straight line. He's dead. No, the heart is stopped. Straight line, the cardiogram will be turned off. After more than 130 cases of assisted suicide, Dr. Kevorkian says this is the first time that he taped the moment of death. And he says he did it to force his own arrest for euthanasia. So he can have a trial to finally resolve whether he is right or the prosecutors are. The story will continue after this. No, no. No commercials. Either they go or I go. What does that mean? They or I go. If if I'm acquitted, they go. Because they know they'll never convict. If I am convicted, I will starve to death in prison. So I will go. One of the two of us is going to go. And that's why I did this. The issue has got to be raised to the level where it is finally decided. You were engaged in a Political, medical, macabre, a publicity venture. Mm -hmm. Right, probably. And in watching these tapes, I get the feeling there's something almost ghoulish in your desire to see the deed done. Well, it could be. I, I can't. That maybe it is ghoulish. I don't know. It appears that way to you. I can't criticize you for that. But the main point is you, the last part of your statement, that the deed be done. Tom's family, his wife, Melody, brothers, Terry and Bob, and his mother, Betty, all say Tom was a fighter, but that he finally decided he needed Dr. Kavorkian. I'm so grateful to uh, know that someone would relieve him of his suffering. Um, I I don't consider it murder. I consider it humane. I consider it the way things should be. And I take it that you would not be sitting here unless you thought it was useful, socially useful, to have this broadcast. Absolutely. I th we we were at the end of our rope. We we didn't have any options. Mm -hmm. And if it weren't for Dr. Kavorkian. I'm not sure what we would have done. You want Tom to be, forgive me, a poster boy for euthanasia? Oh, well, exactly not. Uh, Tom is very private, and also he believes it's, it's a private issue. You should be able to do what makes sense to you. And um, I'm shocked that it's come to this, that it, in the 90s we have to make such an issue out of something that a person should be in control of their own life and death. <sighs> but Dr. Mark Siedler, director of the Center for Medical Ethics at the University of Chicago, watched Dr. Kevorkian's tape with me, and he was appalled. We're, we're watching a medicalized killer. I was, uh, I was shocked, almost speechless, as we watched the tape. It was, it was such a frightening spectacle. Siegler sees little difference between assisted suicide and euthanasia. 
and he is against them. There are many of us who are worried that, um, that legalizing or permitting uh, euthanasia is, is dangerous to patients and dangerous to society. Why? It, it certainly was not dangerous to this patient. Well, I mean, the patient is dead. Yes, he's the patient dead. is dead. He wanted to be dead. He signed a letter twice suggesting Nay, yeah. acknowledging that he wanted to die at the hands of Dr. Kevorkian. Yeah. The, the, the heart-wrenching case is, is the hardest case to argue against. I, I guess the arguments against it is that we can do better than kill people when, when they're near the end of life. We, we can do better with end-of-life care. So Dr. Ziegler says those who want to die should be made as comfortable as possible, but he says euthanasia poses a threat to society's most vulnerable people. Euthanasia for the mentally incapacitated, euthanasia for the physically incapacitated, euthanasia for uh, infants and children who can't act themselves. Dr. Kevorkian says he's focusing on euthanasia that is demanded by the patients, and he is not worried about possible abuse. Everything can be abused. You learn from abuse, you punish the abuser, and then, then you, if you want to control you say only certain doctors can do this in certain areas, nobody else. Got that? That's all you're controlling. The medical examiner called Tom Young's death a homicide, a term that he's used before for assisted suicides. Kevorkian told us the authorities probably do not know that this was euthanasia. He says the medical examiner suspects that he was involved, but two months after the death, the police have still not questioned him about it. He gave us the tape, he says, to force their hand. Absolutely. Absolutely. I've got to force them. Okay. Well, I think you get the point. And we understand what happened to him. He did. He was tried. They did eventually come and he was sent to jail. Um, basically, just to summarize what he says at the end, he was arguing for this right for himself and right for others. So it gives you a sense of where he was at in his mind. Okay. And why he did what he did. And, and uh, anyways, so I'll see you next week. God bless you all. Have a good weekend. Because the guy, the guy like cancer or something. No, he had uh, Luke Eric's disease, um, ALS, which is again amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. Yeah, it attacks the nerves, and so you, your muscles start to disintegrate. You can't move. As you can see, he couldn't talk. He was, his mind was still there. But I, you might eventually lose your mind because it attacks the brain as well. Yeah. Okay. I was I was curious. I was like, huh. Yeah. I wonder. Is it, isn't it legal in some states? It is to do to euthanize. Oh, uh, to like assisted suicide. It is. Um, it depends on the state. Some states allow direct euthanasia that the 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 doctor can do it. Actually, I have a map here. One second here. <laughs> Yeah, and the euthanasia is legal. Um, actually, I think I have a better map here. Legal for a doctor to prescribe the medication. This is in the purple in the United States. You can see these states here. Yeah, so it's legal. I don't know if direct euthanasia, I'd have to check that out. I don't know if direct euthanasia is legal, but for a doctor to prescribe medication that a person would then take, might be illegal. It looks like all of Canada is legal for euthanasia in general. For yeah, to prescribe and both to administer it. So it would be physician assisted suicide and euthanasia are both permitted. Yeah. Uh, and then the difference between the two again is Euthanasia is where the physician directly, like what he did, administers the lethal medication to the person and well, kills the person directly. Yeah. The person doesn't do anything. They're they're completely passive. They just accept, you know, the put the meal in. Physician assisted is where the person is given the means to do it, and the person either takes the medication, or you saw with Dr. Kevorkian's contraption, he would insert the needle, and then the person would himself or herself actively push the button. Right. So they're committing suicide, but they're being assisted by a physician. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, have a good day. You too, sir. Okay, God bless you all who are watching.